Good afternoon and welcome to Georgetown University. My name is Matthew Carnes and I have the privilege of serving as the director of our Center for Latin American Studies here at Georgetown. With our over 200 year legacy of academic excellence, our Washington DC location, our Jesuit values and our regional networks, Georgetown is proud to be one of the leading US universities engaged in Latin America. Faculty and students across our research and teaching programs address critical challenges facing the Americas, including economic growth and innovation, governance and the rule of law, social and cultural cohesion, and hemispheric relations. Georgetown University actually has very deep historical ties to Latin America, reaching back all the way to our founding in 1789, when the Society of Jesus already was operating for more than a century and a half with schools throughout the hemisphere. Today, Georgetown is part of a network that extends to 58 institutions stretching from Argentina to Canada. Georgetown's current engagement with Latin America stretches across our schools, including our medical center, our law center, and all of our main campus schools. Our main hubs of, of research, teaching, and outreach include our Center for Latin American Studies, housed in the Walsh School of Foreign Service, the Latin American Leadership Program here in the McDonough School of Business, where we find ourselves today, the Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in the Americas at our Law Center, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Americas Initiative at Georgetown College. Now today, we're delighted to welcome you to this extraordinary film screening and discussion with President Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia, a Nobel laureate and tireless champion of peace, justice, and reconciliation in his country's decades-long armed conflict his personal journey through the peace process has been documented in the remarkable film we'll see in just a few moments, Port of Destiny, Peace. Following the screening of the film, President Santos will engage in dialogue with Ambassador Jeff De Laurentiis, who served as the charge of affairs at the United States Embassy in Havana, Cuba, during the restoration of relations from 2015 to 2017. Prior to that historic role, Ambassador De Laurentiis served as political counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Bogota, a position in which he frequently met with then yet to be President Santos, and it was in that experience that he prepared so well to be the interlocutor with President Santos today. Now you'll see in your programs that tonight's film was to be introduced by Jack Leslie, the chairman of Weber Shadwick and a graduate of Georgetown. Unfortunately, he's unable to be with us due to a recent death in his family, and I've assured him of our sympathy and our prayers for him and his family. And instead, one of Georgetown's very own graduates, Kelly Laferriere, class of 1995 from our School of Lang Languages and Linguistics, will introduce the film. Kelly is senior vice president at Sellers Easton Media, a media company dedicated to telling stories of leadership and of impact. Kelly has worked in the business of media and entertainment for over two decades at venues including ABC and ESPN and in tasks ranging from programming, production, and acquisitions. She combines an eye for compelling storytelling with an attention to detail in all of her projects. Port of Destiny, Peace marks Kelly's debut as an executive producer, a role she shared with Nina Easton, the founder of Sellers Easton Media. So now I invite you to please all join me in welcoming Kelly back to Georgetown. Hello everyone. It's a real pleasure to be back at Georgetown to introduce this film, a one hour documentary that will give you an inside view of how this hemisphere's longest running civil war has finally come to an end. It is the story of the determination of one man who is here tonight, Juan Manuel Santos. I work with Sellers Easton Media with former senior fortune editors Nina Easton and Patty Sellers to tell the life stories of leaders and of leadership. Spring 2017, Jack Leslie, graduate of the School of Foreign Service, approached us about capturing a great and historic story of global impact. A story about how a leader brokered a peace agreement for his country winning the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize. But few knew or understood the story behind what it took to end 50 years of civil war. It was a story that wasn't being told because of divisive politics of the country. As outsiders with deep journalistic experience globally, we were able to approach the story of former President Santos with clear eyes. Our founding co-partner, Nina Easton, is an accomplished political historian, a 2012 Harvard Kennedy Fellow, 
and current associate at CSIS, a premier Washington, D.C. foreign policy think tank. She's interviewed Fortune 500 CEOs, government leaders all over the world, and is a commentator on foreign policy in the global economy. Nina spent scores of hours interviewing the key players on and off camera, and her partner, filmmaker Robert Abbott, an Emmy award-winning producer and director with more than three decades of experience, was on the scene with us. Robert's incredible bilingual crew and his passion for this story really brought it to life. But what sets this film apart is the tremendous access that we were granted by Santos and his family. We traveled to Bogota, Colombia, spent time in the president's private quarters, and flew in military helicopters through former FARC territory. We interviewed President Santos, his family, political leaders on all sides of the spectrum, and victims of the 50 years of violence. Thank you to former President Clinton, another Georgetown graduate, and Prime Minister Tony Blair, also interviewed by Sellers Easton, for their intimate perspectives on their friend and fellow statesman. Thank you to the Santos family, including eldest son Martin, who's also here tonight, for their eloquence and their openness. And most of all, thanks to Juan Manuel Santos for his message of purpose and principle that resounds as much today as it did in 2016. Thank you for coming and please enjoy Port of Destiny, peace. Wow, that was an emotional film. Mr. President, welcome to Georgetown. The way we're going to work it is I'll ask the President a few questions, uh, and then, uh, and then I'll, we'll open it up to the, uh, uh, to the audience. One personal indulgence, if you'll um, forgive me, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank you for receiving a hungry political officer years ago in Bogota. That was me. Um, uh, it's, it's very important for all you aspiring uh, diplomats to find uh, political leaders willing to engage uh, with uh, uh, young diplomats. It made a very big difference uh, uh, to my career, and now I have an opportunity to say thank you. So, so let me start with a couple of questions uh, coming out of the film, looking back. Um, as I said, it was, quite, it was quite an emotional film. After the ups and downs, the referendum, the Nobel Peace Prize, literally a political and emotional roller coaster, what was it like to walk through the port of destiny? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Father, and thank you all for being here and for inviting me to this great university. Thank you, Kelly, for the presentation. I, I, I want to simply emphasize on one point. You said one man, Juan Manuel Santos. Now, this is an effort of many, many people. Uh, a lot of people put all their energy, their passion, in order to achieve what we achieved, and we're still struggling because one thing is peace making, and another more difficult is peace building, which we're starting to do now, and it will take a long time. What it was, what was it, and how can, uh, did we achieve this? Uh, it's a, a difficult question to answer in, in a short amount of time, but you need, as the title of this documentary, you, you need a clear objective, and you need to persevere no matter what happens. As you saw in the documentary, I was in the Navy, and there they taught me how to sail. And at the beginning, they, they gave me a small sailboat, and I was a recruit, and the officer said, Santos, go and learn. And it was very difficult, it was impossible. And he simply said, choose a point where you want to go, and use the winds to get there. And that's a tremendous lesson for uh, life, for the companies, for countries. You need to establish your port of destiny or destination. And peace became my port of destination um, 
in an encounter I had with Nelson Mandela. I was the, the chairman of the Eighth Conference of Trade and Development um, back when I was Minister of Trade in the early 90s. I had lived, as you saw, all my life in the middle of the conflict. And he told me, uh, I went to give the chair, the presidency to Mandela, to South Africa. That morning, I switched on the television and the most incredible uh, live scenes uh, uh, were going on. The victims and the perpetrators were together, some of them embracing, others shouting at each other, accusing each other. And uh, it was a bizarre uh, situation, but that was live television in South Africa. And that, that afternoon, I had a 15-minute meeting with Mandela, which became five hours. Wow. And uh, at the end, he said, uh, your country is a great country with a great future, but to have that great future, you must finish the war. And uh, that's where I sort of reemphasized my port of destination. And uh, you have to persevere, and you have to create the conditions. This is very important. Uh, we we studied, and I studied, all the uh, peace processes that had been negotiated, as was said in the documentary, learning the lessons that would be applied to the Colombian conflict. Um, and um, I remember one of the advisors, this is a unique thing about the, the process, is I brought in people from outside with fresh minds and hands-on experience one of them was uh, Shlomo Ben-Ami. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, had been the Israeli foreign minister during the Camp David agreement and very, very knowledgeable of the peace process. And he said, uh, he said, uh, uh, you need to bring in the region. In today's world, uh, an asymmetrical war like the one we had can only be negotiated successfully if the region and in the international community supports it. At, when I became president, we had no relations, no diplomatic relations like we are right now with Venezuela mm. and with Ecuador. And we had to change that. That was one condition. Another condition was uh, uh, changing the, the balance of power the, of military power in favor of the state. Otherwise, the guerrillas will never sit down in good faith. A third condition was convincing the leaders of the FARC with a carrot or with a stick that is in their own interest to negotiate peace, not to continue the war. And uh, that is one of the reasons why I took the decision when I, it was a very difficult decision to take out the number one and we took out the number two, and we took out 37 right. of their leaders. Uh, so it's a, it's a process. You have to know where you want to go, and you have to create the conditions. And that's why I say that any conflict in the world can be solved if you have the political will, and the, part, the two parts have the political will to end the conflict, and uh, through dialogue, and through persuasion and through hard work, you can achieve it. Now, uh, you encounter many problems. One of them is public opinion. President Clinton uh, sent me a book uh, where he had many of his speeches where he emphasized that almost in every peace process, uh, at the beginning, there's a very high political cost. Uh, in the case of Rabin, it cost him his life. Right. He, was, he was killed. Um, the, in the case of Mandela, President Clinton, in the speech that he gave in the funeral of McGuinness, one of the negotiators of the uh, Northern Ireland Agreement, he, he said, uh, Mandela called me one day and, and he was desperate. They're really criticizing me. They're really uh, tearing me apart. 
and uh, Clinton asked Mandela, uh, who, you're, you're the, the people from, uh, from the apartheid? He said, no, no, my own people. And this is something that happens. Um, and uh, usually a peace process involves decisions that uh, do not satisfy the extreme of one side or the extreme of the other. But it's a cost that you have to incur uh, to get an agreement. And, and how do you build trust with a, with a group whose actions everyone abhors? That, I imagine, was the toughest it's, thing to it's do. It's a process. Uh, I mean, I was the symbol of what they fought uh, for against for 50 years. Uh, I was high class mm. uh, institutions. Uh, my family used to own the, the most important newspaper, Liberal Party. What they fought, I was a symbol. And uh, so when, when we started negotiating, uh, you, you build trust very slowly with gestures. For example, something which, which uh, happened. When I took the decision to go after the number one, of course I was risking the peace process because I, have, I had already started to, to talk to him indirectly. But I had said to them, uh, we will apply the Rabin doctrine. Rabin being the Israeli prime minister when he negotiated with Arafat that said, I will negotiate as if there is no terrorism and I will continue to fight and, and to combat terrorism as, as if there is no negotiation. And I said to the FARC, we will do the, the, the same. Until we have an agreement, there will be no ceasefire. And you can kill me. That's part of the rules of war. Uh, personally, you can, mm -hmm. you can kill me or I can kill you during the war. It was very crude, but afterwards, when we signed and we, they said that this is one of the decisions that built trust in them. It's a paradox, but it did. It, it was, they were very hurt, but they said, this guy, you could negotiate with him. Uh, another mechanical uh, diplomatic question. How important was the role of the UN Security Council once things got far enough along? Extremely important. Without the support of the international community and the Security Council, I think uh, that uh, this separate would not have been succeeded. Uh, it is the process where the Security Council has unanimously approved more resolutions in favor. No other process since the, U the UN was established yeah, it's true. after the Second World War. And everybody, because it was the only, as, as two secretary generals said, Ban Ki-moon and Guterres, it's the only good news <laughs> that yeah. the Security yeah. Council has had in I don't know how many years. So they were very enthusiastic. <laughs> they went to Colombia. They went to visit where we had uh, the guerrillas concentrated after they gave up their arms. So it was very important. Sticking with the Security Council for, uh, for just a, a second, in the film it, it uh, mentions that uh, two, two women from the military had come up with the idea to rescue um, the hostages. And in my many years at the UN, we worked to advance the importance of women's involvement in, in peace and security issues and to correct the exclusion of women uh, from participation in the peace process. There's a Security Council resolution 1325 that enshrined this. And it seems to me that you completely embraced this notion. Uh, you had uh, a very strong foreign minister, Marianne uh, Holguin, a uh, strong UN ambassador, Maria Mejia. Uh, can you talk about the, how important that perspective uh, was as you move through the process? Well, this process, uh is unique in many ways, uh, this agreement. One of the aspects that is very important, makes this unique, is that for the first time, we put the victims in the center 
of the solution of the, of the conflict. The victims and their rights, their rights to justice, to reparations, to the truth, and to non-repetition, which is uh, what is established in the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. This is the first agreement that is negotiated under the umbrella of the Rome Statute. Now, the victims, women are the more, are the more victims of the victims. Right. They, ha they suffer more than men in wars. Uh, uh, sexual violence, uh, their kids, their, uh, they suffer more. So uh, we put, for the first time also, a special chapter in the agreement that had to do with women, as a sort of an affirmative action in the post-conflict to give women a sort of a, a, a extra benefit of the, of the post-conflict and the benefits of war. And during the process, I must say, uh, I use the victims as, uh, as a, a source of energy. Uh, a professor um, of Harvard uh, of leadership uh, told me at the beginning, whenever you're sad, whenever you want to throw in the towel, it's going to be very difficult. Hear the victims, their stories, and that will give you more, give you uh, energy to continue. And so I started to do a disciplined exercise every uh, week. My, the head of the, of the victims unit in the government, which was a woman, brought me a victim, a woman. And, and she told me stories like the one that you saw there. This is one of the eight million victims. Right. Of course. And, and, and that also was very important in, in establishing uh, the, the sort of the, the ground rules of the, of the process. We took the victims to Havana, to Havana to talk to the perpetrators, most of them women. They were very strong, but at the same time, they were the most generous in terms of they said, President Santos, continue because we don't want other people to suffer what I suffered. And so it was the, the, the role of the, of the women was, was very important. And uh, I think this is an aspect of this process that it has to be always underlined. So, so now looking forward a little bit, of course, the film at the end mentions that your successor, uh, opposes the peace accords, or at least during the campaign made that clear. So, so what is the status now? What parts uh, are not being implemented that should be? Well, we took care of, of the implementation uh, uh, by different sort of roads. We, we were able to uh, have the, our highest court, the Constitutional Court, uh, make a ruling whereby no government for the next three governments can approve a law or make a reform that goes against the compliance of the agreements. If they do that, it would be struck down by the Constitutional Court, and they have been very strict in that. Yeah. So in a way, uh, the agreement is uh, shielded. The international community has played a part of pressing the implementation. Uh, President Duque, in his campaign, said he was against the agreement, but usually, uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no exception. Uh, when you go into government, you do something different from what you promised in the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said. I will comply, because he knew that right. he, he could not say simply, I'm going to do away with the... Uh, what has happened is that uh, he says uh, something, and uh, in the bureaucracy, you find other people that think differently. But I think that we have there again to persevere. This is why, why I say that the process of reconciliation, uh, the Pope, which was a great ally here, um, I went to visit him about five or six times. I always wanted to invite him to, to Colombia 
to stimulate the people for, and, and the guerrillas to sign the agreement, he said to me, I will go to Colombia when I will be most needed. And he went after we signed the agreement. He went and he put the title of his visit. I come to Colombia to push the Colombians to, pay, to take the first step towards reconciliation, which is going to be the most difficult part. And we're in that process, uh, convincing people that it's better to have peace than to have war, which sounds ridiculous, right. but well. it's a reality. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but I think that the people are starting to, uh, the, the ones that were not convinced uh, are starting to see that uh, the benefits of the peace process, that we were not uh, giving the country to the communists, that we were not giving the country to uh, Chavez and the, right. they called me uh, Castro Chavismo, that the, the, they accused me of being a, an accomplice of, uh, of, of Chavez and of Castro. And, which was all these f fake news that are so <laughs> are so common now in in, uh, Even in Colombia and ar too. around here, I think. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but you have to you have to right. uh, handle those things and 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 keep on going. So, what would your advice be now uh, to your successor with regard to the talks with the ELN, which of course have well, been suspended? My I have made a promise not to uh, bother my successor. I don't want uh, 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 to do what was done to me, which was very detrimental for the country, right. polarize the country, and uh, so I, I'm not going to give him any advice. I would say that in any situation, you cannot close the door to dialogue. Uh, you can be very tough. As a, we were tough with the FARC. Right. I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't have been tougher. But you have always to, uh, you have to leave a door open to settle things through dialogue, uh, if the conditions are right. And that would be an advice for everybody. So I can't uh, cede my uh, time to, uh, to the students that I hope will be asking questions without um, asking about uh, Venezuela and, and how you would approach the situation as president given the weekend's events, the Lima Declaration, and so forth. Well, what I just said, um, in situations like the one we live in in Venezuela, I had to confront that uh, uh, very directly. I opened um, the doors to the Venezuelan uh, refugees, 1.2 uh, million when I left office. And, uh, I gave, we, we gave them uh, um, education, health, and helped them in, in every way possible, tremendous problem. Um, and uh, the confrontation with Maduro, well, that uh, increased uh, on a daily basis. Uh, he accused me of, of uh, being behind his assassination attempt when there was a military parade. Uh, uh, at that time, I was baptizing my first and only granddaughter, which is a great thing I, uh, to have. And I, I said, uh, I have much better things to do uh, <laughs> uh, than yeah. go uh, assassinating uh, uh, heads of state or presidents or, or neighbors. Um, the, the, uh, the way out there has to be also a door opened. Uh, you call that in, 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 uh, in the international negotiations uh, a golden bridge, uh, where you have to give the regime a way out. Right. Otherwise, they will die fighting or defending themselves. And we have to avoid, by all means, a bloodbath in Venezuela. Why do I say this? Because uh, Venezuela, since the Chavez years, at uh, the very beginning, he put a, a factory of AK-47s. And he started to produce AK-47s like producing bread. And he gave hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans, an AK-47. 
you cannot imagine how many Venezuelans have an AK-47 under their bed. Yeah. Those are the uh, defenders of the revolution. So there's a lot of people armed there. Venezuela is not a country accustomed to violence as Colombia has been. We've been living through civil wars all our 200 and years of Republican life. And whatever transition there is, there's going to find, find a Venezuela which is destroyed institutionally, even uh, including the armed forces. So if there is a violent transition, the, the aftermath would be very difficult to administer. And that is going to have a terrible reper uh, uh, repercussion in Venezuela and in Colombia. So by all means, we need a peaceful transition. And uh, what could be a peaceful transition? I told uh, President Trump uh, almost two years ago, Venezuela is like a, a plane that uh, ran out of fuel. That plane could have a soft landing or can crash. It is in the interest of everybody to have a soft landing. And in order to have a soft landing, you need the major stakeholders to be uh, in agreement with a soft landing. Who are the major stakeholders in this case? China, Russia, Cuba, the United States, and Latin America. Um, the UN Secretary General was very reluctant to intervene. He saw that the opposition did not have any uh, coherence and the, uh, it was very difficult. So he was very reluctant. I pressed him a lot. Many people pressed him. But lately, he has said he would be willing to mediate mm. if the two parts uh, agree. The same thing with the Pope. The church had been very reluctant, and the Pope said, if the two sides ask for mediation, we will, we will, will be willing. Uh, so I think that a mediation uh, to negotiate this golden bridge is the way out. Because uh, we are in, there's a, a game here that is called chicken, no? Mm -hmm. Two cars are going to crash and see who, who turns first. Well, they're playing chicken there, and this is very, very risky. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, this mediation or some kind of negotiation, some kind of dialogue, you cannot, you, you cannot uh, solve a problem without talking about it with the people who are in the middle of the problem. So somebody has to have the rationale. I know that dialogue is, uh, right now uh, not the best word because dialogue has been used by Maduro to simply uh, prolong the agony of Venezuela. Right. Yeah. But I think the, the conditions are, are right now to say, okay, it's, it's the moment uh, with conditions, with conditions or preconditions for this dialogue, but it's the only way out peacefully. Otherwise, we will have a bloodbath and everybody will lose. Okay, uh, I want to open, up, open it up to the audience. Um, there are microphones on both sides. I hope very much to hear from uh, students and uh, please state your name and identify uh, your school and, and uh, all I ask is that you do your best to stick to questions uh, and forego uh, statements so we can get as many uh, questions in as we can. Okay, I'll start on this side. Yes. Hi, good evening, President Santos. My name is Manuela Hernandez, and I'm in the School of Foreign Service and the MSFS program. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more about the implementation of the peace treaty, specifically about the transitional zones that were set up 
across the country, the 26 that were supposed to be administered by the UN. Um, and I'm wondering um, what your thought process was, because I know that it was um, spoken to not be equipped with the necessary resources to feed the ex-combatants and reintegrate them into society. So if you can talk more about the different tra transi transitional zones and what went wrong. Thank you. Uh, could you rephrase that? Uh, I guess. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Just um, the implementation of the transitional There's zones. more implementation on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how is that going? Or no, why, maybe why your administration didn't focus enough resources to make them succeed? Why the administration is not following through with the implementation, is that? Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question because I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, some people in the, in the administration have a, an Orwellian, George Orwell, uh, a Orwellian mind. They want to change the definitions of, of things, of reality. For example, some people think that there, is no, there was no armed conflict in Colombia. If there's no armed conflict in Colombia, you cannot apply transitional justice. If you don't apply transitional justice, you don't have peace. And now uh, it's not called the Peace Commission, it's called the Stabilization Commission. And, uh, but, it, but they're trying to change the words, but reality is there. And I hope that they realize, and I've seen uh, in, in some people uh, within the administration, a, a positive change of realizing that this is in the benefit of the government, of the regions that were affected by the, con by the conflict, and of the country in general. There are two aspects of this agreement which are very unique. One is the transitional justice. This is new. We're setting precedent for other armed conflicts. The whole in institutionality has been put in place and this will not go backwards. Some people are trying to put uh, 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 poles in the in the in the wheel, but but this will this will go this will not go back. The other very important unique aspect was that we negotiated development plans for the territories that were affected by the conflict. 15-year development plans. There. Uh, and I said it since the beginning, with or without FARC, these regions need more roads, hospitals, schools, and so this has to be done. And uh, I think people are realizing that that's true. So I hope that this initial reluctance of some people of, of going, going forward uh, will be in a way defeated by circumstances and by the pressure of, the, of their, own, their own people that with whom we negotiated these 16, 15, 16 territorial development plans. The people are anxious, are expecting it. And they will press. And I hope that the government delivers. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, this side. Okay. Hello, Mr. President. I'm Jia Ju Wu from China. And I admire your efforts to save the Columbia. My question is that as a student or as a normal person, when we are involved in a terrible war, what can we do? And what did you encourage the students and kids in Colombia to do when, uh, during the civil war? Yeah. Good. Uh, um, it, it, the, the question is what can s students in Colombia yeah. do to ensure the oh, oh, process is me, successful? Uh, for the students in all the world, f for example, for me, if I was involved you know, what, what can I do? What should I do? In, in, in general. In general. Yeah, in general. In general. What, what do students, what can students do? Oh, they can do a lot. The students, for example, when, when, when we lost the, the referendum, um, fortunately, my constitutional court had given me a way out. And it said in a ruling that approved the referendum, um, that if I lost the referendum, or if the referendum was lost, if you negotiated a new agreement, uh, you could take it to the normal channels, which is not a referendum, but a 
taken it to Congress, and this would be, become a legal uh, decision. Uh, the students mm. were the ones that, when we lost the referendum, it really went out. Many of them had not voted, but they understood what was happening, and they filled the plazas of many cities in Colombia, uh, demanding a new agreement now. And they, they were really uh, active, positive, optimistic, and I think that was also a very important uh, sort of uh, force that allowed us to renegotiate the agreement. And uh, the youth and the students all around the world, if they unite, n nobody can defeat them. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Over this side. Thank you, President Santos. Uh, my name is Luis Parada, and I'm a double graduate from the government department and the law school. I am from El Salvador, and as, as you know, El Salvador had a peace agreement in 1992, right. and then it had an amnesty in 1993 that was just declared unconstitutional two years ago, and now the Congress is working on a new amnesty. So I wanted to uh, see if you could please give us some advice uh, to El Salvador on how the amnesty was treated uh, in, in Colombia. Was it an unconditional amnesty, or was it tied to a condition to assume and recognize responsibility? Uh, thank you, sir. That's a very, very important question. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one of my advisors was one of former guerrilla leader, Joaquin Villalobos, uh, who is now a professor today in, in Oxford. He was one of the five advisors that had been uh, with me in all this process. We are the first, or Colombia is the first country that solves an armed conflict um, abiding by our own constitution and international law. Uh, amnesties, outright amnesties, are prohibited today. You cannot uh, give amnesty to people who are responsible for war crimes or crimes against humanity. They have to be uh, judged, condemned, and through transitional justice, pay uh, or be sanctioned. Uh, go, uh, uh, but this is the, this sanction is different from the normal sanction. That's what people don't understand, because transitional justice has more to do with repairing the victims and uh, telling the truth as a way to, to uh, comply with the justice system. Uh, so in the case of Colombia, the most responsible of those crimes are rejudged, condemned, and they are uh, very clear uh, sanctions for these crimes if they say, if they tell the truth, and if they repair the victims. Otherwise, they, they will go to a normal, or, or instead of eight, eight years ago, 20 years, to a normal prison. So it's a, it's a different approach. There's no amnesty for the most responsible, and that is in compliance with the um, internal law and international law the international community. So uh, what happened in Salvador will not happen in Colombia because the International Penal Court is there uh, observing that there is no impunity and if they see that there's impunity, they will go in. And we have been very careful of doing things where so, so that the International Penal Court or anybody can tomorrow say, no, there, there was impunity. Some people, some critics, because we don't apply normal justice, say that there's impunity, but there is not. We are applying transitional justice. Thank you, sir. If I can just take half a uh, second so, to. Sorry, I've to, got, I just I've got like some to, more. Just want to just want to introduce Bernie Aronson, who's here, who was the architect of El Salvador's peace process. <laughs> yeah. okay. Absolutely. 
This side, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Santos. Um, I'm Alejandro Correa. I'm a senior uh, studying government here. Um, I wrote a paper last year about the activists and community defenders that feel very vulnerable at the moment in Colombia, and I just wanted to know your thoughts on solutions for uh, protecting the, these activists um, after the peace deal. The, the assassination of the, of the, the uh, activists, yeah. of the social leaders. Yeah. Yes. yes. This is a this is a, a tragic circumstance. Uh, <coughs> the, the the social leaders that have been assass assassinated until the the day I left office, uh, we, we were following very closely what was happening. It had uh, different sources. One, we put in place an agree, uh, a, a strategy which is extremely important to maintain, whereby the FARC agreed to collaborate uh, in the legal, in the su uh, substitution of the coca crops for legal crops. To do away, and this is the only way, to really uh, decrease the amount of cocaine produced in Colombia. Uh, we have tried every other uh, path and uh, it doesn't work. The only way is to give these families an alternative. And so, because the war ended, we can reach those families, and we did reach them. And we started the substitution of legal crops for illegal crops for legal crops, and the drug traffickers, the Mexican cartels, and the local drug traffickers started to assassinate the leaders that were promoting the uh, substitution of illegal for legal crops. That was one source. Another source. Uh, is the ELN and uh, the few, the dissidents of the FARC that want to maintain control of the territory and they wanted to simply uh, make a, a show of power. And the third source is the, uh, the uh, uh, fight among the different illegal groups uh, because these where they are being killed are corridors of drug trafficking. Uh, and among them, that's a third source. And I uh, think that uh, we should do a lot more. I hope this government does a lot, does a lot more uh, to fight these, uh, these assassinations. It has started to come down. And we press very much the uh, Attorney General to go after the responsible, uh, um, about 50% have already been solved of the crimes, uh, which is not something that you uh, brag about, but at least there's a lot more progress uh, from the justice point of view on these assassinations than the murders in general. Um, that's what, what is happening. It's one of those aftermaths of the, of the, of the peace process, and uh, I hope that we can control that in the territories where the military went and were able to establish their presence, the murder rate was very low. Where they didn't, that's where the murder rates went high. So the, the, the long run solution to that is more presence of the institutions, not only the military, but development in general. Let's swing back to this side. Yes. Good evening. My name is Colleen, and I'm a student in the Masters of Science and Foreign Service. Um, in the film, the, it was described the important role the international community played during the peace process. Could you describe what role, if any, you envision for the international community throughout the implementation and the funding of the, of the uh, peace process? The, the role of the international community now in the, oh, in the right now. implementation. Well, uh, I, I think a lot. First, continue the pressure from outside to to uh, oblige the government to comply. Uh, sort of be a, 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 a watchful eye. This is important. Um, international cooperation is also important. 
many of the, of the programs were financed by international cooperation, specifically uh, targeted, um, for, for example, the demining, which unfortunately, I don't know why, they stopped the process of demining, which is one of the most beautiful and more necessary uh, uh, post-conflict uh, uh, objectives to demine the country. Colombia was the second most mined country in the world after Afghanistan. And this was going very well, and suddenly what they tell me is that it's almost stopped. Uh, there, the international community helped a lot. I think it could continue to help a lot. I, I see no reason why the government would say no. Uh, the substitution of illegal crops for legal crops. We have a problem, for example, with the United States. They say, we cannot finance that because we're financing the FARC, and the FARC's still in the list of terrorists, terrorists. which is a contradiction. They, the United States uh, demands of Colombia, or ask Colombia, stop the drug trafficking, and we start substituting and say, give me the money for that, and they say, no, we can't because legally we can't. Uh, you, you, uh, you explained to me that contradiction. <laughs> uh, uh, no, thank you. But the, <laughs> <laughs> but the international community can help a lot there. And many of the programs that are already in place, are already uh, in motion, many of them, uh, need financing. Uh, the government sometimes have simply said, we have no money, we have fiscal problems, uh, and the international community can help there. For here. Good evening, Mr. President. I'm Juan Catala, a student at the School of Foreign Service and Venezuelan. I have two very short questions. The first one is very during, short. Very short. <laughs> during your administration, the illegal production of cocaine increased by five times. Why do you think this happened under your administration? And what do you think about its impact on the Venezuelan territory? It, 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 you said illegal uh, drugs or the cultivation? The, the cocaine production. Co oh, okay. Coca production. Coca production. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the coca production, which we have been fighting since uh, Plan Colombia in the early 90s or even before, uh, when I was Minister of, of Defense, we sprayed more hectares than ever before, and the production went up. Um, in the last years uh, of, the, of my administration, the coca production went up for two reasons. First was the perverse incentive when we announced that in the agreement we will uh, have a program to benefit or to benefit in, a, in, in not to benefit, but to you know, stimulate the substitution of illegal crops for legal crops. So a lot of people said, oh, there's going to be a benefit, and they went and planted more. At the same time, if you see what happened <laughs> with the exchange rate, um, right after the price of oil went down dramatically, the exchange rate went up dra dramatically. Uh, and uh, therefore, the profits for I in, the, in the business of coca production, which is a product that is sold in dollars, consumed in dollars, but produced in pesos, so the profits went up dramatically. Those two factors explain the increase of the hectares uh, dedicated in, uh, to coca. However, we have a plan, was established at the beginning of last year. This government uh, took that plan and, and said, uh, sort of confirmed it whereby you have a combination of voluntary substitution and forced eradication. I don't think that spraying, again, is the uh, correct uh, uh, strategy. It doesn't work. Um, I don't think that the Constitutional Court will allow it. Um, I do think that uh, <coughs> voluntary substitution and forced eradication is the only way to reduce again, and last year we were able to uh, take out of production 100,000 hectares, which is more than half of what has been uh, 
established as uh, uh, coca planted in Colombia. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to restrict you to one question just like everybody else. Please, over here, because we're running out of time. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Natalia Cala. I'm from Colombia and a first year student here at the McDonald's School of Business at Georgetown. First of all, I would like to thank you for helping set Colombia in the right path and also starting to rebrand its image to the rest of the world. And I would like, like to ask you if there is something you would change about your input or your influence during the peace process, what would it be? Of the influence of whom? Yours. Okay. <laughs> the, the, well, the peace process in, in me? Yeah. Oh. Uh, the reverse, yeah. Uh, my influence Change. in the it, peace process? It, yes. If you, anything you would have changed? Oh, that I would have changed. Well, I, I, I probably made many mistakes. Um, uh, but, uh, for example, I, uh, I learned that referendums don't work. The British I, would say I, the same I, thing. For, for example, <laughs> we decided to negotiate uh, in a sequential way. Uh, we had five points, we negotiated one point, and until we finished, we went to the second point. That was a mistake. We should have negotiated simultaneously because we would have earned or we would have saved a lot of time. And the implementation and the signature would not be, in a way, uh, overlapping the presidential campaign that politicized the process. Um, I failed, I underestimated the power of fake news. I, I really thought that the outrageous things that they were saying about the peace process and uh, about what, what I was doing was so outrageous that nobody would believe it. Well, I was wrong. A lot of people believed it and still believe it. Uh, so uh, these are aspects that you look back and say, Maybe I, w I would have done things differently. Um, maybe uh, the, uh, the role of the regions uh, during the peace process to, to explain to them more what we were doing. But that has, that has a... a it's pros and it's cons. For example, I was I was I was uh, I learned that uh, a peace process is like a painting. Uh, you only you only uh, show it when it's finished, because if you start showing different aspects of the peace process uh, individually, uh, almost everything is not popular because it's, it's in a way a concession to terrorists. I mean, to put it in a very blunt way. It's only when you have the whole package, you said, this is peace, and this is war, and this is the cost of peace you choose. Uh, but that was very difficult in today's world with the media, every day in social media, uh, uh, um, publishing everything that we did on a daily basis. I underestimated the consequence of that, if I look back. So communications in a peace process is much more important than what I thought. Thank you. I'm afraid this is uh, gonna have to be our last question. I'm sorry to, to everyone uh, who was waiting, um, please. Good evening, President Santos. My name is Maria Carolina Duran, and I did my LLM at Georgetown. <laughs> um, I have one question. At the beginning of the documentary, you said that you hope the peace you achieved lasts forever, and I certainly hope so as well. But the peace agreement was only the beginning, as you said later on. It's now we need to build peace. As a strategic thinker, in your opinion, what should be Colombia's next primary focus? We have the ELN, the FARC dissidents, the victims, corruption, to name a few. <laughs> What would be the, the, well, you have to establish uh, priorities and you cannot ignore 
we, 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 peace is not paradise. Peace right. is, is a, a step towards, some, towards a better country. Uh, and as I said, and, and I didn't say, President Clinton said, peace is, peace is the beginning, or, or, or the Prime Minister, of, uh, Tony Blair, peace is the beginning, the signature, not the end. Uh, reconciliation, for example, is something that might take generations. Uh, 50 years of war leave many, many uh, wounds open. And uh, you have to go and uh, persuade people to uh, share a common objective with their former enemies, that I call them adversaries, because enemies has a very destructive connotation. Uh, education in that, in, in that uh, uh, sense is extremely important. Um, war is very um, a factor that stimulates a lot of corruption uh, because since people are concentrated in war, then the corruption becomes as, uh, as, uh, a less important factor. And you can see how peace brought immediately corruption to a priority in Colombia, which is good. Mm -hmm. You have to fight corruption in every way possible. Um, also, uh, the objectives of, this, the, um, of the economy and the, your social uh, policies. We, in, at the same time that we were negotiating, we were very careful in, in applying policies that had uh, um, good social results. For example, Colombia, because we applied, we innovated there, uh, we applied the, the teachings of a very important uh, and famous professor. He was my professor, uh, Amartya Sen, on fighting poverty, the multi-dimensional index. That's why Colombia is a country in Latin America that during the last seven, eight years has decrease poverty more than any other country and decrease inequality more. We still have a long way to go, but those aspects are an important complement of the peace process. Another aspect is, I, and I say this, reconciliation among people is very important, but we must reconcile again with nature, the environment. Colombia is a very rich country in terms of biodiversity. Uh, the war made tremendous damage to our environment. And so we have to now reconcile ourselves with the environment, climate change. Uh, we used to have a president who also thought that climate change did not exist. Uh, <laughs> we created the Ministry of, uh, of the Environment. Here we have the last Minister of the Environment. And we made a very aggressive, uh, we put in place a very aggressive policy to protect are, for example, our paramos. The paramos are, are the moors, are special ecosystems that are uh, fa factories of water, <coughs> uh, special ecosystems where, where Colombia had no interest in the paramos. Uh, and uh, you probably study here that the next wars in, in, in the world will be fought around water. And Colombia is very rich in water, and we were simply destroying those factories of water. We now have the 37 Paramos uh, uh, identified and protected. I received 12 and a half million hectares of protected areas. Colombia is the richest country per square kilometer in biodiversity in the world. And I increased that to 43 million hectares of protected areas to protect our biodiversity. We have to do a lot more. Deforestation, because of the peace, is unfortunately causing a, a, a tremendous damage. Mm -hmm. But those aspects are, are very uh, important to take into account. So you have to, like everywhere in the world, have a comprehensive approach. You set, out, you set your priorities. But peace is always a high in the list of priorities because if, as Mandela said, with no, a country at war will never, never succeed. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we've been sitting with a statesman, uh, someone, in my humble opinion, who's done extraordinary things for Colombia uh, and for the world as well. Please join me in thanking him for being here.